I guess many of you who are watching this video know about HTTPS and some of you may have set up SSL or TLS for your web server but how many of you understand deeply how SSL or TLS works? Do you know what really happens during a TLS handshake? Why do we need to handshake? What cryptographic algorithm are used by TLS to protect the data? Why do we need digital certificates? Why does it need to be signed by a certificate authority? What is a digital signature? And how is it generated? There are a lot of questions, and I don't want to just scratch the surface. So this is going to be a very thorough video to tell you everything about SSL or TLS, an extremely important building block of the security over the internet. What is SSL or TLS? Well, SSL stands for Secure Socket Layer. It is a predecessor of TLS. And TLS is the short form of Transport Layer Security, which is a cryptographic protocol that provides secure communication over a computer network. Here's a bit of the history of SSL and TLS. SSL was originally developed by Netscape, and it was first published in 1995 with version 2. SSL version 1 was never publicly released because of some serious security flaws. In 1996, the SSL version 3 was published as a complete redesign of the protocol. Then three years later, TLS 1.0 was first defined in RFC 2246 by IETF as an upgrade of SSL version 3. And it took seven years to upgrade it to TLS 1.1 1 .1 in 2006. TLS 1.2 came right after that in 2008. Then finally, after 10 years in the making, we got TLS 1.3 with a huge improvement in 2018. So at the moment, which SSL or TLS version still exist? Well, the SSL version 2 was deprecated in 2011. SSL version 3 was deprecated in 2015. And recently, in March 2020, TOS 1.0 and TOS 1.1 was also gone. That means only TOS 1.2 and 1.3 are still alive. Okay, so let's see where TOS is being used. First, it is widely used on the web. All the websites that you visit with HTTPS are secured by TOS. Or we often say HTTP over TOS. Similarly, Email with SMTPS protocol is in fact SMTP and TLS. Then FTPS for secure file transfer protocol is also FTP plus TLS. And there are many other applications of TLS that I don't have enough time to mention. But why do we need TLS? Why is it so important? Because TLS gives us three things. First, authentication. TOS verifies the identity of the communicating parties, which normally be clients and servers. With the help of asymmetric cryptography, TOS makes sure that we will go to the authentic website and not a fake one. Second, confidentiality. TOS protects the exchange data from unauthorized access by encrypting it with symmetric encryption algorithms. And third, integrity. TOS recognizes any alteration of data during transmission by checking the message authentication code, which we will learn about in a moment. Now the next question is, how does it work? Basically, TOS consists of two phases, or two protocols. The first one is handshake protocol. In this phase, the client and server will negotiate the protocol version. Select cryptographic algorithms, or cipher suite. Authenticate each other by asymmetric cryptography and establish a shared secret key that will be used for symmetric encryption in the next phase. So the main purpose of the handshake is for authentication and key exchange. The second phase is record protocol. In this phase, all outgoing messages will be encrypted with the shared secret key established in the handshake. Then the encrypted messages are transmitted to the other side. They will be verified 
to see if there's any modification during transmission or not. If not, the messages will be decrypted with the same symmetric secret key. So we will achieve both confidentiality and integrity in this record protocol. And because the amount of encrypted data in this phase is large, this is often called bunk encryption. Now you may wonder why TLS uses both symmetric and asymmetric cryptography. Why not just use one for all? Well, it's easy to see that symmetric cryptography can't provide authentication. Since there's only one secret key for both client and server, so they know nothing about each other to verify. Not to mention that how they come up with the same key without leaking it to the public is hard. How about asymmetric cryptography? Sounds like a good candidate. Unfortunately, it's much slower than symmetric cryptography. And by much, I mean from 100 times to even 10,000 times lower. So clearly it's not suitable for bug encryption. All right, now let's learn more about symmetric cryptography. I guess you've already known the basics. First of all, Alice has a plain text message that she wants to send to Bob, but doesn't want anyone in the public zone to read it. So she encrypts the message with a secret key that they have shared with each other before. Then she sends the encrypted message to Bob via the public internet. Upon receiving the encrypted message, Bob will easily use the same secret key to decrypt it. Since the same key is used for encryption and decryption, it's kind of symmetric, so we have the name Symmetric Cryptography. Now, there might be a hacker, Harry, who can catch their exchange message on the public network. However, the message is already encrypted, and Harry doesn't have the secret key, so he won't be able to decrypt it. But he can still change it. There's one technique called bit flipping attack that works like this. Let's say this time Alice is not talking to Bob but talking to her online bank and she wants to send $100 to someone. The message is encrypted with a secret key and sent to the bank via the internet. Now Harry catches the encrypted message. Although he can't decrypt it, he can flip some of it bits from 1 to 0 and 0 to 1, then forward that modified message to the bank. Now when the bank decrypts it, they will get a different plain text content. In this case, it has become $900 instead of $100. So it's very dangerous. That's why we need to make sure that the encrypted message hasn't been altered during transmission. But how? One way to do that is to use authenticated encryption. The idea is to not just encrypt, but also authenticate the encrypted message. The first step is encrypt. Alice's plain text message goes through a symmetric encryption algorithm, such as AES-256 GCM or ChaCha20. This encryption algorithm also takes a shared secret key and a random nonce or an initialization vector IV as input, and it will return the encrypted message. The second step is to authenticate. The encrypted message, the secret key, and the nonce become inputs of a MAC algorithm, such as GMAC if you use AES-256 GCM, or Poly-1305 if you use ChaCha20 encryption algorithm. This MAC algorithm acts like a cryptographic hash function, and its output is a MAC or message authentication code. Now this MAC will be tagged along with the encrypted message and the final result will be sent to Bob. Because of this, we sometimes call this MAC an authentication tab. In TOS 1.3, besides the encrypted message, we also want to authenticate some associated data, such as the addresses, the port, the protocol version, or the sequence number. This information is unencrypted and known by both communicating parties. So the associated data is also an input of the MAC algorithm. And because of this, the whole process is called Authenticated Encryption with Associated Data, or in short, AEAD.
Now we will see how Bob can check that the encrypted message hasn't been changed during transmission. It's simply a reverse process. Starting with the encrypted message with Mac. We untag the Mac from the encrypted message. Then the encrypted message will go to the Mac algorithm together with the shared secret key and the nonce. Note that this is the same nonce that is used in the encryption process. Usually the nonce is padded to the encrypted message before sending to the receiver. The associated data will also go into the Mac algorithm and the output of it will be another mark. Now Bob can simply compare the two Mac values. If they are different, then he knows that the encrypted message has been changed. Else, he can safely decrypt the message and use it with the confidence that it's the same plain text message that Alice sent. However, there's one question. How Bob and Alice share the secret key with each other without leaking it to the public? Well, the answer is they need to use asymmetric or public key cryptography for that purpose. Specifically, they can use either Diffie-Hellman ephemeral or elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman ephemeral. Okay, let's see how Diffie-Hellman key exchange works. First, Alice and Bob both agree on two numbers, the base G and the modulus P. These numbers are known publicly by everyone. Then each of them secretly choose a private number. Alice's private key is number small a, and Bob's private key is number small b. Then Alice computes her public key big A equals g to the power of small a modulo p and sends it to Bob. Similarly, Bob computes his public key big B equals to g to the power of small b modulo p and sends it to Alice. Then Alice will receive Bob's public key big B and Bob will receive Alice's public key big A. Now the magic happens. Alice computes big B to the power of small a mod P and Bob computes big A to the power of small b mod P and these two values magically equal to the same number s. Why? Because if you do the math, they both equal to g to the power of a multiplied b mod p. So Alice and Bob come up with the same secret number s without leaking it to the public. However, keep in mind that each encryption algorithm may require a secret key of different length. So to make the secret key, Alice and Bob must put s to the same key derivation function and the output will be a shared secret key of required length. In TLS 1.3, we use a HMAC-based key derivation function, so that's why the name HKDF. Let's learn a bit more about this key derivation function. Generally, the KDF takes an input key material or IKM, in our case the IKM is the number S, and we need to tell the KDF how long we want the output key to be, such as 128 bit. Then the KDF also needs a cryptographic hash function, such as HMAC SHA-256, and optionally some context or application-specific information, and a sort. With all of the input, the KDF will produce a secret key of required length. Now get back to the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. We know that P, G, Big A and Big B are known to the public, which means the hacker Harry also has access to those numbers. We may wonder, is this key exchange mechanism secure? Or given P, G, Big A and Big B computed by these functions, can Harry figure out the secret numbers small a, small b and s? Fortunately, these functions will become trapdoors if we choose good values for p, g, small a, and small b. For example, choose p as a 2048-bit prime number, choose g as a primitive root modulo p, and choose small a and small b to be 256-bit random integers. A trapdoor function basically means it's easy to compute in one way, but hard in the other. In this case, 
given p, g, and small a, it's easy to compute big A. But given p, g, and big A, it's very hard to compute small a. It's easy to see that big A can be computed pretty fast with O log of A time complexity. It's a well-known modular exponentiation problem. Computing small a, on the other hand, is much harder. It's a discrete logarithm problem, which takes our current generation of computers a very long time to solve. So we are at least safe for now, or until the next generation of strong quantum computers comes into play. However, for now, a long time to solve doesn't mean unsolvable, right? If Alice and Bob use the same private keys, smaller a and smaller b, for every session that they communicate, then what happens is, Harry can record all of those sessions and start solving for small a from the session 1. Although it would take him a long time to solve it, let's say after session n, he gets the right small a. Now he can use it to compute the secret number s, and thus he would be able to decrypt all of the recorded conversations. Does this sound scary? How can we prevent it? The answer is ephemeral key. As the name may suggest, we use different private key for each session. So even if Harry can solve the secret key for one session, he could not use it for the other ones. This is called perfect forward secrecy in TLS. So now you understand what Diffie-Hellman ephemeral means. It's just Diffie-Hellman with ephemeral or short-lived keys. How about elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman ephemeral? Well, elliptic curve cryptography or ECC is an approach to asymmetric cryptography where the algorithm is similar but a different trapdoor function is used. The trapdoor function is based on the algebraic structure of elliptic curves, and that's why the name. One amazing value of elliptic curve cryptography is it requires smaller keys to provide the equivalent security level. You can see in this comparison table with RSA. The US National Security Agency, or NSA, used to protect their top secret with ECC 384-bit key which provides the same security level with the RSA 7680-bit key. Sounds amazing, right? However, elliptic curve cryptography is an easier target for quantum computing attack. Sean's algorithm can break ECC on a hypothetical quantum computer with less amount of quantum resources than to break RSA. There might be decades before that strong quantum computer actually be built and used. But have we prepared anything for that yet? Is there any quantum resistant algorithm? Yes, there is super singular isogeny Diffie Hellman key exchange algorithm, which is also based on the elliptic curve cryptography. But that's another story though. Now let's get back to asymmetric cryptography. It's an awesome technology that has a wide range of applications. We've already explored one of its applications which is for symmetric secret key exchange with Diffie-Hellman ephemeral and elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman ephemeral. In fact, RSA algorithm was also used for key exchange in the past, but it has been removed in TOS 1.3 due to various attacks and no forward secrecy capability. Asymmetric cryptography is also used in encryption system. Here are some asymmetric encryption algorithms. RSA with optimal asymmetric encryption padding, RSA with public key cryptography standard 1, then Elgamo encryption algorithm. And finally, another important feature of asymmetric cryptography is for digital signature, which TLS uses extensively for authentication. Some popular digital signature algorithms used in TLS are RSA with probabilistic signature scheme, Elliptic Curve Digital Signature Algorithm Edwards Curve Digital Signature Algorithm We will learn about digital signature shortly. But before that, let's learn how asymmetric encryption system works. Similar as in symmetric encryption, Alice has a plain text message 
that she wants to send to Bob. But this time, there's no shared secret key. Instead, Alice encrypts the message with Bob's public key and sends the encrypted message to Bob. When Bob receives the message, he uses his private key to decrypt it. Although the public key and private key are different, they are still connected by some trapdoor function, just like what we have seen in the Diffie-Hellman algorithm. The idea is, keys come in pair, and only the private key of the same pair can decrypt the message encrypted with its public key. Because of this, even when Harry the hacker has access to both Alice's encrypted message and Bob's public key, he cannot use that public key to decrypt the message. Therefore, the public key sharing becomes very simple. Bob just sent the key to Alice directly over the public internet, without the fear that the key can be used to decrypt any messages. The key is public, so anyone can use it to encrypt messages that only Bob can read, even if they have never talked to each other before. It's really mind-blowing, isn't it? However, life is not that so easy, although we know that Harry cannot decrypt the message with Bob's public key. He can still interfere with the public key sharing and replace Bob's public key with his own public key. Now when Alice receives the key, she still thinks it's Bob's public key, but it's in fact Harry's. So if Alice encrypts her message with this key, Harry would be able to decrypt it with his private key. The reason this can happen is because a key is simply just a number, and there's no identity information to tell us who its owner is. So what can we do? Obviously, we should put the key together with some identity information, and that's nothing else but a digital certificate. So Bob puts his key inside his certificate, which has his name and other identity information on it. The certificate acts like a passport in the real world. But how do we know it's really Bob who owns that certificate? What stops Harry from making a fake certificate under Bob's name but with Harry's public key? Well, just like in a real world, the passport must be issued by a passport authority after a process of identity verification. In digital world, the certificate must be verified and signed by a certificate authority. This certificate authority and passport authority are trusted third party who helps us prevent creation of fake passport and fake digital certificate. The certificate signing process happens like this. Bob has a pair of public and private key. In the first step, he creates a certificate signing request or CSR. This CSR contains his public key and some identity information, such as his name, organization, and email. Then the second step, he signs the CSR with his private key and sends it to the certificate authority. The certificate authority will verify Bob's identity in the certificate. They can contact him to ask for more proof if necessary. Then they use Bob's public key in the certificate to verify his signature. This is to make sure that Bob really owns the private key that paired with the public key in the certificate. If everything is valid, the CIA will sign the certificate with their own private key and send it back to Bob. Now Bob will share with Alice this certificate which contains his public key instead of sending just the public key as before. Upon receiving the certificate, Alice can easily verify its authenticity with the public key of the certificate authority. Because of this, Harry cannot replace Bob's public key with his key anymore, since he doesn't have the CIA's private key to sign the fake certificate. Note that this only works because we all trust the certificate authority. If somehow the CIA is not trustworthy, for example, if they give Harry their private key, then we are in a serious trouble. In reality, there's a chain of certificate authorities where at the top level is a root certificate authority who signs their own certificate and also signs a certificate of their subordinate, which is an intermediate certificate authority. 
this authority can sign the certificate of other intermediate authorities or they can sign the end entity certificate or leaf certificate. Each certificate will reference back to the certificate of their higher level authority up to the root. Your operating systems and browsers store a list of certificates of trusted root certificate authorities. That way, they can easily verify the authenticity of all certificates. Okay, let's check out a real TLS certificate of YouTube. On Chrome, we click this lock button and choose certificate. This is the end entity certificate. It was issued by Google Trust Services or GTS with the signature algorithm is RSA with SHA-256 hash algorithm. The certificate's public key uses elliptic curve cryptography with key size is 256 bit. So the key looks quite short. And this is its signature, signed by GTS. If we scroll down a bit, we can see that this certificate is used for many Google websites, including youtube.com. And it will expire on May 26, 2020. Now let's look at the certificate of the authority who signs this certificate. It's an intermediate certificate authority, and its name is Google Trust Services. It also has a public key, but with different type, RSA encryption. Therefore, the key is much bigger, 2048 bit. And this is its signature, signed by the root authority. The root certificate authority is global sign. And here is its RSA public key. And its cell side signature. We've talked a lot about digital signature. So let's see how it really works. To sign a document, the signer first needs to hash it, then the hash value is encrypted using the signer's private key. The result will be the digital signature. Then this signature will be attached to the original document. And that is for the signing process. Now how can we verify that the signature is valid? Well, we just do a reverse process. First we detach the signature from the document. Decrypt it with the signer's public key to get a hash value. Then we hash the document with the same hash algorithm used in the signing process. The result is another hash value. Then we just compare the two hash values. If they are the same, then the signature is valid. Okay, so now with all the knowledge we have gained so far, let's take a closer look at how they are used in the TLS handshake protocol. The TLS 1.3 full handshake starts with a hello message that the client sends to the server. Actually, this message contains a lot of things, but here I just list some important information. First of all, a list of protocol version that client supports. Then a list of supported AEAD symmetric cipher suite. In this case, there are two options, AES 256 GCM or cha, -Cha 20 poly 1305 After that, there's a list of supported key exchange groups. For example, this client supports both finite field Diffie-Hellman ephemeral and elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman ephemeral. That's why client also shares its two public keys, one for Diffie-Hellman and the other for elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman. This way, the server will be able to compute the shared secret key, no matter what algorithm it chooses. The last field client sent in this message is a list of signature algorithm it supports. This is for server to choose which algorithm it should use to sign the whole handshake. We will see how it works in a bit. After receiving the client hello message, the server also sends back its hello message, which contains the selected protocol version, TLS 1.3, the selected cyber suite, AES 256 GCM, the selected key exchange method, Diffie-Hellman ephemeral, and the server's public key for that chosen method. 
The next field is a request for the client's certificate, which is optional and will only be sent if the server wants to authenticate the client by its certificate. Normally on a HTTPS website, only the server side needs to send its certificate to the client. And that is sent in the next field of this message. The next field is Certificate Verify, which is in fact the signature of the entire handshake up to this point. Here's how it is generated. The whole data from the beginning of the handshake up to the certificate request is called a handshake context. We concatenate this context with the server certificate, hash it, and sign the hash value with the server's private key using one of the signature algorithm that the client supports. In a similar fashion, the server finish is generated by concatenating the handshake context the certificate and the certificate verify, hash it, and put the hash value through the MAC algorithm of the chosen cipher suit. The result is the MAC of the entire handshake. Here the server certificate, certificate verify, and server finish are called authentication messages because they are used to authenticate the server. With the signature and the MAC of the entire handshake, TOS 1.3 is safe against several types of man-in-the-middle downgrade attacks. Now after the client receives the hello message from the server, it will validate the server's certificate with the root authority and check the signature and MAC of the entire handshake to make sure it's not being tampered with. If everything is good, then the client sends its finished message with the MAC of the entire handshake up to this point. And optionally, the client certificate and certificate verify in case the server has requested. And that's the whole flow of the full TLS handshake. To improve the performance, client and server don't always go through this full handshake. Sometimes they perform abbreviated handshake by using pre-shared key resumption. The idea is, after the previous handshake, the client and server already know each other, so they don't need to authenticate again. So the server may send one or multiple session tickets to the client, which can be used as the pre-shared key or PSK identity in the next handshake. And it goes with a ticket lifetime as well as some other information. Now in the next handshake, the client will send a simple hello message which contains a list of PSK identities or tickets obtained from the previous handshake. A PSK key exchange mode, which can be either PSK only or PSK with Diffie-Hellman. If the PSK with Diffie-Hellman mode is used, then the client also needs to share its Diffie-Hellman public key. This will provide perfect forward secrecy as well as allow the server to fall back to full handshake if needed. When the server receives this client hello message, it sends back its hello with the selected preset key identity, the optional Diffie-Hellman public key of the server, and the server finish, just like in the full handshake. Finally, the client sends back its finish, and that's the end of the PSK resumption. As you can see, there's no certificate authentication between the client and server in this abbreviated handshake. This also opens up an opportunity for zero route trip time data, which means the client doesn't need to wait for the handshake to complete to send its first application data to the server. In zero route trip time, clients send the application data together with the client hello message. This data is encrypted using the key derived from the first PSK in the ticket list. And it also adds one more field, early data indication, to tell the server that there's early application data being sent along. If the server accepts this zero route chip time request, it will send back the server hello, just like in the normal PSK resumption, and optionally some application data as well. The client will finish with a message containing the map and an end of early data indicator. 
So that's how zero write chip time works in TLS 1.3. It plus is reduce the latency by one write chip time. But the cons is opening up a potential threat of replaying attack, which means the hacker can just copy and send the same encrypted zero write chip time request to the server multiple times. To avoid this, the server application must be implemented in a way that's resilient to duplicate requests. Now before we finish, let's do a quick comparison of TLS 1.3 and TLS 1.2 to see what's new. First, TLS 1.3 has several key exchange mechanisms, where the vulnerable RSA and other static key exchange methods are removed, leaving only ephemeral Diffie-Hellman or elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman remain, therefore achieved perfect forward secrecy. Second, TLS 1.3 handshake is at least one route chip faster than TLS 1.2. Symmetric encryption in TLS 1.3 is more secure because AEID CyberSuite is mandatory and it also removes some weak algorithm from the list, such as block cipher mode, RC4, or ChipDesk. The CyberSuite in TLS 1.3 is also simpler since it only contains the AEID algorithm and a hash algorithm. The key exchange and signature algorithms are moved to separate fields while in TLS 1.2, they merge into the cipher suite. As we can see in this example, Diffie-Hellman ephemeral is a key exchange, and RSA is signature algorithm. This makes the number of recommended cipher suites become too big, 37 options in TLS 1.2, if I remember correctly, while in TLS 1.3, there are only 5. Next, TLS 1.3 also gives us stronger signature since it signs the entire handshake, not just cover some part of it, as in TLS 1.2. Last but not least, elliptic curve cryptography gets a significant attention in TLS 1.3, with some better curve algorithm added, such as the Edward Curve Digital Signature algorithm, which is faster without sacrificing security. And that's everything I want to share with you in this video. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you guys in the next one.